And my next guest is a PhD trained at Harvard. His name is Matt Lalonde. How you doing, Matt? Hey, I'm doing good. How are you? And you were recommended to have on the show, uh, actually by a few different listeners, because it, it seems like, like so many things in life, the Paleolithic style of eating is becoming very popular now. It's becoming a buzzword. You hear it in mainstream media. Soon, Dr. Oz will be talking about it and taking credit for inventing it. Um, and, and, but, but everybody you talk to has a different slant on paleo nutrition. If you talk to, um, individuals like the esteemed Dr. Lauren Cordain, uh, you'll find that he is really not a fan of carbohydrates to say, uh, the least and, you know, and vegetables exclusively as your carbohydrate source. Um, if you talk to individuals, uh, and, and you name them, you know, you have those who are of the camp that, Fruit is evil. Those who are of the camp that fruit is necessary. You have those of the camp who say carbohydrates have to be included. Some say they don't have to be included. And, and all of a sudden you think to yourself, oh my goodness, there's not one way to apply the paleo diet. Are you noticing this? Well, yeah, and it's not surprising to me. Human beings are, you know, multivariate, uh, affected by their genes, their, um, gene expression, their environment. Environment actually infects gene expression. And the way that you want to implement this will depend on a variety of things, more or less your training, your lifestyle. So I would not expect to see just you know one size fits all application here. And I'll go ahead and say, I think the reason why people may have recommended me on the show is I don't have any books to sell. I don't have any DVDs. I don't. I'm just an educator. This is an organic an organic chemist perspective on what I initially consider to be soft science. So, you know, when I speak, it's, you know, I don't have to worry about not stepping on other people's toes. I don't have to worry about not selling my books or contradicting what I've already said. I am interested not in having the right answers or not in have my answers being right, actually, but I'm interested in the right answer. I got you. There's a big difference between the two. You're absolutely Yeah, right. very big difference. And unfortunately, in this field, I find that there's a lot of people that refuse to change their minds because they've written it in their books. And from a hardcore scientific perspective, that is absolute nonsense. I mean, the, a good scientist, when shown evidence of the, to the contrary, will change their position. Okay, now you mentioned something a second ago that's, that's a belief of mine. There, I, I, I tend to believe, as opposed to the Paleolithic diet, I believe in the ancestral diet because of polymorphisms, because of maybe food availability in different regions of the world. Your genetics may have evolved under conditions. So this one-size-fits-all approach that, oh, well, this is how Paleolithic man ate. Well, that's probably how Paleolithic man ate who lived in this region of the world, but not necessarily in that region of the world. What would you say to that? Do you think that polymorphisms play a role in how you should be choosing the food you eat? I would agree that there are some adaptations that have occurred. You know, one of the famous ones that's put out there all the time are European herders that got adapted to lactose by uh, producing lactase or keeping lactase activated later on in life. So yes, depending on your lineage, where you come from, uh, you are going to have, you know, a different micronutrient ratio that's going to, you know, be best for you. But then that can also change depending on epigenetics, what your grandmother ate, what your mother ate. Bingo. That's going to affect how you are going to process food. If you go a little bit further than the grandmother epigenetically, it doesn't come all that. Um, the effect is, uh, is not all that great. And then the type of training. I mean, would I put an endurance athlete on a low-carb diet? Absolutely not. There's no way. Why? Well, why? But, I mean, the reason I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being, uh, you know. No, no, let me tell you why. It. Because there's, so those who, you... there's those who will say that, uh, that, that gluconeogenesis is the most intelligent method of supplying the body with glucose. Yes. So there is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. Glucose right. is essential, but your body can make it. So right. you don't have to obtain it from the diet. The problem is that gluconeogenesis is fairly slow, is not a very fast process. You can regenerate liver glycogen for, you know, over a period of 24 hours. But if you're running a marathon in three hours or less, simply not enough. Gotcha. And you are running that at six minute miles, very high intensity. You need to burn sugar while supplementing with some amino acids 
to make sure that cortisol is not going to munch into your muscle mass. So what happens if you try to do this kind of work, and I actually ran the experiment on myself, I would be, I keep telling people I'd be a lot healthier if I didn't have to run these experiments to prove a point. <laughs> they actually don't mean much because they're only observational experiments of n equals one where the observer is the experimenter, so they're horrible, but there's still one data point, one, you know, right. case study, if you will. So I started doing high intensity training on a very low carbohydrate diet, only meat, vegetables, and animal fat. And what happened is that cortisol started rising uh, higher and higher. The reason for that is that cortisol is involved in this response that tells the liver, hey, you need to upregulate gluconeogenesis. Like, you need to turn this on much faster now. And cortisol is going to go get some amino acids, some glucogenic amino acids by degrading muscle mass. And it does that because there's, you know, a limit to glycolysis in itself, especially when glucose is in short supply. If your cortisol levels keep rising, they'll eventually level off. And at that point, you might think, well, hey, I'm fine. They're not going any higher. But what's going to happen then is that your testosterone levels are going to hit the floor, your free testosterone levels. And if you look at overtraining and something called a free testosterone to cortisol ratio, right. you're going to find that that ratio is a very good indication of whether or not you're overtrained. And if you do high-intensity exercise on a low-carbohydrate diet or when you're carbohydrate-restricted, your testosterone is going to hit the floor. Not a good deal. And cortisol is going to be very high. So in, are there instances where sugar is acceptable? Well, if by sugar you mean a table sugar? No, I mean, look, I remember when I first started training a decade ago, the, 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 the step du jour was uh, – you know, 50 grams of protein, 80 grams of dextrose, some creatine monohydrate right after your workout. Mm -hmm. And I did that for a couple of years. I don't know that it benefited me, but um, I was using just very, very fast acting sugars at that point yeah. in time. Today, yeah. I don't I don't do that because I'm, I'm opposed to sugar because of its uh, glucose signaling leads to cellular senescence. So I'm thinking, well, I'm 53 now. Aging better, aging better is more important to me than getting bigger. Yeah, there's a lot of confounding factors there. So by sugar, this time you meant dextrose. And it's very important to make that distinction. When you say sugar, are you talking about carbohydrates in general? Are you talking about dextrose? Are you talking about fructose? Because those I'm talking have about simple, simple sugars. So. Yes. Yeah, so in this case, you said dextrose. And dextrose is glucose. Now, let's say you are running a marathon. Your muscles are burning a lot of glucose. And right. it would be a smart idea to replenish glucose or to, you know, to feed glucose to the muscles. So having dextrose post-workout or during the race is a good idea if you're talking about athletes that are, say, involved in, uh, for example, CrossFit competitions. They just performed one workout. They've got another one coming up an hour, two hours later. No time for digestion. You know, you've got to get the simple pre-digested carbohydrates and amino acids in there not protein and complex carbohydrates those will come in after the you know after the, the trial is done and you've got time to eat and digest so they have a place a time and a place and then of course there's the whole thing about fructose does that have a time and a place probably so the amount of um let's say glycogen or glucose that the liver can store is about 400 grams of the numbers that you throw around you can find uh you know, severe glycogen de uh, depletion articles that say it's a little bit higher. Other people will say it's infinite, but that's in a diseased state where it's infinite. Whereas the muscle is about 1,600 calories. So you could say, well, I should be eating a, you know, glucose to um, or dextrose to fructose ratio that's about 4 to 1. But the problem is that when you consume fructose, it gets into the liver, it gets phosphorylated at the one position, right. and fructose 1-phosphate upregulates glucokinase, which turns the increases the liver's capacity to process glucose. So the ratio is probably more of like somewhere between 4 to 1 to 10 to 1, but it is also useful to an extent when you're doing a lot of high-intensity training to have some fructose in there to replenish um, liver glycogen. Galactose from lactose will do the same thing. Actually, okay, probably. all right, and I, 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 we have to take a break. I want to come back. Now you, 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 you talked about galactose. Dr. Cordain talked about galactose the other day. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, I want to talk about you, you, you talked about very high-intensity uh, exercise routines like CrossFit and so on, but some guys are just going out there and doing a, a more of a bodybuilding workout. I want to address yeah, that as fine. well. So, so okay. we're talking with Matt Lalonde. We're talking about really the application of a paleo style eating in modern day with those of us who train like athletes. 
Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Talking with Matt Lalonde this hour, really about the application of the paleo style of eating for those of us who train like athletes. You know, our goals are, 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 are varied. I want to live long. I want to be healthy. I want to stave off age-related disease. But I also want to be able to perform well in the gym. I want to get stronger. I want progress. And if I can't have them both, I'm really going to be upset. Matt's going to help us here now. Okay, so Matt, you've talked about training protocols that really uh, blend the aerobic and anaerobic th- uh, thresholds. Mm-hmm. But what about the guy who just goes in? He's a bodybuilder. You know, he yep. he does uh, he does three sets of bench press. He does three sets of flies. I mean, how much glycogen is he really using? Does he really need the high carbohydrate intake to replenish it? No. And in fact, for some of those folks, I've often in that case in that context recommended a lower carbohydrate diet for the reason that uh, higher fat in the diet is going to reduce the amount of sex hormone binding globulin, which is then going to increase free testosterone. And that is obviously your friend when you're a bodybuilder, uh, I guess natural bodybuilder, because if you're injecting <laughs> anabolics, then it really doesn't matter. Right, right. Okay, let, let's talk a little bit about galactose. Uh, Dr. Mm-hmm. Cordain is a staunch opponent of dairy. Yes. I happen to be a huge proponent uh, of dairy. Excellent. In the, in the, in the, I'm somewhere in, in between. So. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big raw milk, uh, raw, raw, raw unpasture, unpasteurized milk from, you know, uh, mm-hmm. organically raised uh, grass-fed cows. Mm-hmm. And um, the other day on the show, he, you know, was really working hard to, dis- to, to because he likes me, he cares about me, he wanted to discourage me. He said, you know, galactose causes cataracts. Uh, you you know, uh, milk is just no good for you. We shouldn't be drinking milk. We shouldn't be drinking milk. We shouldn't be drinking milk. So something that you said at the beginning of the show that I'm a big believer, that's epigenetics. If my great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents and great-great-great-grandparents use dairy, am I not better prepared to use dairy then? It is very likely to, if you are descending from European hoarder, herders, uh, that your you know lactase activity is pretty good now. Whether or not that's the case, lactase activity will decrease a little bit as you age, and to you know get people on board here, lactase is the enzyme that's going to decompose lactose, the disaccharide, the disaccharide, into glucose and galactose, the monosaccharides. But raw milk has lactase in it. Unlike, once yep. it's pasteurized, it's destroyed. It, it has some exactly. It has some lactase in it. I think, um, so Cordain has come up with a very good hypothesis with regards to beta cellulin, but it remains to be tested. The, when I look at the big picture, there are a lot of good things in milk, especially the milk of animals that have been fed uh, grass. Right. You're going to find a lot of healthy fats, conjugated linoleic acid, transpalmitoleic acid, vaccinic acid, all of these things. If you had one thing to point out as a problem is its high IGF-1 content. But why, is that, like, but why is that always a problem? Everybody talks about high IGF-1 being a problem. Mm-hmm. But so IGF-1 is a double-edged sword. It is great for muscle repair. It is great for growth, but it also increases aging. If you have cancer, it will feed, it will promote cancer. So it's not, you know, if you look at the IGF-1 levels of a population, the people with the highest levels tend to die a little bit younger. So it's not necessarily a good idea to be... But, but okay, I have to ask you this. Is it the... Yeah. Uh, is it the I, uh, we also know that transgenic rats that overproduce growth hormone die much younger than their litter mates, and we also know that s- individuals who suffer from agromegalia have very short lifespans. Mm-hmm. Now, growth hormone produces IGF-1. Is it the IGF-1 that's corollary or causative? Is it possible that it's the growth hormone that's shortening life, not the IGF-1? Well, if you have growth hormone to boot, then you're going to further augment IGF-1. Right. Right. Uh, but, you know, let me finish there because there is some good news here. It turns out that very quick fermentation, maybe even to the order of three hours for yogurt and then, of course, for cheese even longer, completely destroys the IGF-1. So if you like your dairy... If you, you know, just have the fermented kind and of course make it full fat because that's where your, the benefits come from. It's the good fats that are in there, the butter fat. Or have the butter, have the cream, have the sour cream that's fermented and most of the, of the problematic compounds in the milk will be gone. 
Also, the fermentation is going to affect the lactose content. If you look at a very uh, well-aged cheese, there's not a whole lot of lactose right. that's going to be left in there. Right. Uh, and there's plenty of benefits uh, in added vitamin K2, for example. So you are making the whole thing uh, much more nutritious in, in that regard. So when people you know, talk about even raw milk, like having a lot of raw milk, I'm like, mm, I wouldn't have a ton of it. But if you're talking about fermented dairy, I'm fine with it. You know, as long as you don't have an autoimmune disease, I'm fine with it. You know what I did after after court? Because I'm, I, you said something at the beginning of the show. You know, if you're not willing to look at the science, or not willing to take opinions and change your position. Yeah. So I, I I told my farmer I'm going to hold off on the raw milk. I want five quarts of raw cream every week, and I've switched to cream mm-hmm. because the cream has more fat. Yep. Less lactose in it, yep. and and it has, but it def- definitely increases IGF one levels as well. Yeah, no, maybe not as much, but because the IGF well, actually the IGF one might be in the fat. You know, I'd have to look that up. I think I think it is, if I remember yep. correctly. But yep. but you know what? But then again, I use IGF one long R three pre workout on certain training days, so I I guess the the milk couldn't nearly be doing what the IGF one long R three is doing if IGF one is no good for me. <laughs> so I guess the milk is, is the least of my, my worries at this yeah. point in time. So, I mean, what you bring up right now is, you know, the fact that once you are aiming for truly elite performance in any sport, you are going to have to do things nutritionally uh, as well as, you know, physically that are not going to improve your health. Yeah, that You're going to have health. to sacrifice health yeah. in order to get that. Yeah. Uh, and we see this in a lot of CrossFitters. That they drink a lot of milk, and I'm like, well, yeah, you know, that, that's good. It's good for muscle repair and growth and whatnot, but there's a trade-off there. You are aging yourself more rapidly. Yeah. Uh, you you decide. You have the information. You choose what you do with it. And obviously growth factors that are, appear in just in whey protein. So whey protein probably is not the greatest thing as well because that in- increases IGF-1 levels as well. My guess is that it depends on if it's uh, isolate or hydrolysate. The hydrolysate process would probably denature IGF-1 is my guess. Interesting. Interesting. And that that's the big buzz right now. All right, let's talk about something else for a second. We know that calories are not the important thing, even though the medical orthodoxy, the, the dietetic associations, they all focus on calories in, calories out. We know that that's nonsense. If you eat pure calories from sugar, you'll gain weight as opposed to gain fat as opposed to somebody who eats their, gets all their calories from proteins and fats. But when do calories become relevant? Why, when do they become important to... They, be, they become important once all of your metabolic machinery is working properly and you are seeking to lean out. You have no choice but to curb food intake. And that's the term that I prefer as opposed to speaking of calories because I'm a chemist and I know that how these things are measured and they have very little relevance to real life. We are not bomb calorimeters. The amount, the food that we eat affects our hormones. It's not just burnt. Right. Uh, And it's sometimes incorporated into our bodies. So I don't like that term. So in, in that instance, it's going to matter, and it's really frustrating to me with this attitude in the, the paleo sphere where you can eat as much as you want as long as it's paleo and you're not going to gain weight or you're going to lose weight, and that's just total hogwash. Well, also within the uh, performance industry as well, I mean, uh, people think that because they're training very hard that they can just eat anything that they want as much as they want, and it's not going to matter because they're training so hard. Yeah. You're and not going to burn off metabolic syndrome. I'm sorry. Like, if there's a hormonal effect that is detrimental associated with the food that you're consuming, you're not going to burn that off. Sure, you're going to clear a little bit of insulin and some blood sugar when you do high-intensity exercise, but it's not going to address the problem at the root, which is poor nutrition. And even if you've got really good nutrition, you're still going to have to curb your food intake in order to lose weight. Where did our paleo ancestors find fruit if they lived in extremely cold regions? Well, something I haven't mentioned that I want to address first and foremost before we start is the reason I started doing this is because I wanted to add a a scientific perspective to this thing. Because right now the way that I see it being done is mostly from an observational epidemiology. So the arguments, the whole quote-unquote paleo arguments are flawed because they are only observational in nature. You say, uh, hunter-gatherers ate this, they didn't have disease of civilization. So we eat like them, we're going to avoid diseases of a civilization. That is a hypothesis. You have to go in the lab and prove that that's true. 
when you actually look at the science, you can find ways to tweak it. It turns out that they're mostly right, but there's still ways to tweak it. But to think that you are right because of that is completely wrong. Another argument that I see is that people will say, we evolved for millions of years never consuming these foods, so we're not adapted to these foods. Again, incorrect. There's a number of examples in evolution where species find a new source of food and thrive on it. So just because you've never eaten it doesn't mean that you're not adapted to it. Mm -hmm. But if you look at seeds, and I talk uh, broadly about seeds. So when I say seeds, I mean grains, legumes, pseudocereals, nuts, and edible seeds like sunflower seeds. When you look at seeds and the problematic compounds that they contained, the statement that you can make is that there has not been sufficiently a strong evolutionary pressure to get human beings to be fully adapted to grains and legumes. That is a much more accurate statement and a difference. Well, let's go there for a second. I mean, I've I've railed against legumes and grains because of their lectin content, their anti-nutrient content, not because we are not adapted to them, but because they are pro-inflammatory. What is your position on grains and legumes? Um, so I, I'm going to give a talk at the Ancestral Health Symposium, and I'm essentially revealing some of the material that's going to be in okay. that talk. Uh, as a chemist, I look at every organic molecule individually. Now, there's this thing called thalidomide. It was given to <laughs> pregnant women to prevent nausea uh, back in the uh, in the 60s, and it caused some serious birth effects. And Terrible. if you know anything about chemistry, it turns out that one of the enantiomers was teratogenic, whereas the other enantiomer, the other mirror image, had the right activity. So a very simple change in a molecule structure can completely change its biological activity. And I look at lectins, saponins, uh, glycoalkaloids in the very same fashion. It turns out that some of the lectins in legumes are deactivated by heat. Mm. So if you make your argument specifically only on lectins, and I see some people in the blogosphere, in the paleo blogosphere, make some damning mistakes in that they will indict all lectins as being bad. If I were to say that to a plant biologist, he would consider me a crackpot, yeah. like completely insane, because most plants, if not all plants, have lectins, and it, most of the times they're benign to human beings, and sometimes they're even beneficial. beneficial. Right, exactly. Yeah, so you have to be very careful and consider things one at a time, and when you are looking at that, you have to go further up the chain. Okay, what happens when you cook it? What happens when you ferment it? What happens when you eat it? Right. Right. Does it get neutralized, or does it get changed into something that's even more active? It turns out that for certain saponins, you cleave a sugar, and wow, it becomes even more active and problematic. You have to look at that in that way. Otherwise, if you make broad, inclusive statements, like, for example, I got a you know, paleo diet newsletter from Cordain the other day that was, like, railing off on banana lectin. And I'm like, are you serious? Has it ever been tested properly, shown to survive digestion, shown to bind to enterocytes, show up in the bloodstream, and then get an immune response? Like, do you have all that information? It is really irresponsible to just like take a broad class of compounds and say all of these things are bad. But what's interesting is that when you take a step back and you look at everything we know is problematic, so some of the fructooligosaccharides, saponins, uh, glycoalkaloids, lectins, prolamine proteins, when you take the the whole shebang and you look at it, it's like I'm going to find one of those things that's problematic in grains and legumes. And if not, you then look at sustainability of agriculture and nutrient density, and you can make even more arguments against eating those things. So I can't come up with a good reason at the end of the day for eating them, but you have to, you know, follow this very, you know, conservative, logical pathway to get into your recommendations. Otherwise, you'll come off as an alarmist and no one will pay attention to you. And the reason why I've come to these conclusions is because I'm in the chemistry department at Harvard, and if I'm to talk to my colleagues about this, I have to be very careful. They would laugh in my face if I were to bring up the caveman argument. They totally would. Right. So you, because you have to substantiate everything by science. That's the yes. Point. All right, let's do this. Let's take a quick commercial break. When we come back, I want to touch a base on fruit again, just for a moment. Yep, absolutely. We're talking today with Matt Lalonde. And unfortunately, Matt, do you have a website? No, I refuse to blog. <laughs> Matt doesn't have a website. Matt doesn't have a book to sell. Matt just has information. So I tend to believe a guy like him. You're listening to Superhuman Radio. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Superhuman Radio. My guest this hour is Matt Lalonde. We're talking about applications of the Paleolithic style of eating. 
hopefully someday everyone will eat this way and abandon the methods of uh, nutrition that are being promoted today that are actually leading to a lot of the disease in this country. Is that a misstatement for me to say? Uh, I, I think that they are involved in uh, the promotion of a lot of disease and, and causing a lot of diseases, absolutely. Okay. All right. Fruit. Yep. You know, this is one of those things, you know, fructose uh, turns to fat, uh, it becomes triglycerides first. Uh, it's evil. It's no good. You shouldn't eat a lot of fruit if you're trying to lose body fat. Then there are individuals out there who say that's crazy. You have to incorporate fruit into your diet. Fruit is important. Where do you stand on fruit? Well, first and foremost, this is one place where I find the whole paleo argument fails because there are people that just go nuts on fruit. I shouldn't use the word nuts. They, they eat fruit excessively, <laughs> just not to confuse people. They eat fruit excessively, and then I start thinking, um, do you have any idea what fruit used to look like back then? Because we have been selecting for sweeter and sweeter fruit over time ah. through agriculture. What we were eating back then is, you know, those little crab apples you can find in the wild? Yeah, yeah, that that's tastes what, terrible. That's what, yeah. yeah, that's what our ancestors were eating, okay? And the bananas, they used to be a quarter of the size and mostly fiber, kind of like if they were green. I mean, we are just not getting that much pure sugar or fructose from fruit back then. But then, like I alluded to earlier, depending on where you're at metabolically, athletically, it can be useful in certain circumstances. But there is a lot of confusion when it comes to fructose. First and foremost, I can tell you I have challenged many fruitinarians to getting blood work done, and every time the blood, the blood sugar levels are through the roof. It's like you are pre-diabetic by eating just fruit. Right. Um, so, you know, filling up, it, the problem with fructose is that we sometimes eat it exclu in exclusion of other nutrients. So we, we sometimes eat pure fructose, whereas with other uh, things like palmitic acid, you don't just eat palmitic acid. It comes with other fatty acids that actually change its effect on the human body. So when you eat a ton of fructose, it mostly gets uh, processed by the liver, then by the kidneys and also by the fat cells to some extent. So you're looking at 50%, 70% liver and then the rest, kidneys, fat cells, and sperm cells also wow. use fructose. Um, the problem with the liver is that once, you know, like I said, it turns on glucokinase, so the liver is going to take in more uh, glucose and fructose, more carbohydrate than it typically does. You're going to fill up liver glycogen quite fast because the tank isn't that big. And then once that happens, the rest of the stuff goes into the Krebs cycle where it uh, gets turned into citric acid and, and actually well, it'll get turned into NADH uh, and AD, uh, AD, FADH2, and those things are going to go through oxidative phosphorylation and eventually make some ATP. The problem is that if you overdo it, citrate overflows out of the system, and that goes through de novo lipogenesis. And de novo lipogenesis then transforms citrate or citric acid, depending on whether it's charged or not, into something called palmitic acid. It'll be palmate oil CoA that's then going to be packaged into triglycerides right. and shipped out in the form of VLDL. The problem with fructose is that there's no control mechanism. When it comes to glucose, there's a rate determining step there in making in the diphosphorylation, in making the monophosphate from the diphosphate, the fructose. 1,6-bisphosphate. Uh, There's a rate determining step there, and it is regulated by the amount of ATP and citrate that's in the system. So if the liver cells see a lot of ATP and citrate, they say, okay, you have to slow this down. Whereas fructose can get around that pathway uh, by making the hydroxyacetone phosphate in another, uh, through the aldolases in another way. So it is particularly bad in that sense, uh, and, and I'm talking about excess overconsumption. That, okay, right? so, 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 do you, so you eat fruit, right? No, I don't. I just prefer to get my carbohydrate from, um, you know, sweet potatoes, potatoes, stuff like that. Okay, because I, I I avoid fruit like the pox because I feel like I, I feel like it's going to just cause fat storage uh, and other problems, and I just don't need fruit. And I and I also don't miss fruit. I it's not like I I have to struggle. Oh, I wish I could have you know a banana. I wish I could mm. have some grapes. I mean I over, I mean I'll have fruit periodically if it's there. I'm at someone's house. There's a bowl of fruit. I may grab some. Uh, mm -hmm. cherries or something, but it's not like I, I eat a lot of it, and I, I yeah. try to stay away from it. Okay. I like to get my carbohydrate from potatoes and sweet potatoes. The potatoes are pure glucose, pure starch. The sweet potatoes do have some fructose in there, but the, the load tends to be lower than your average fruit, unless we're talking about lemons and limes. You know, if you really were to go through the breakdown, you would see that maybe some vegetables occasionally have a little bit more fructose than certain fruits, but 
It all depends on the amount of detail you want to go into, yeah. but I am referring specifically to like excess fructose carbohydrate using you know high fructose fruits that your typical go tos like pears and bananas and watermelon and stuff right. like that, grapes, and dried fruit. And then, which leads to the, the, your your initial comment about the the fruit of yesterday and the fruit of today mm-hmm. leads me to a conversation I had with Leslie Aiello from the Winter Gren Foundation one day, mm-hmm. um, and she said to me, you know. Uh, all this hullabaloo about paleo style eating, it's impossible to eat paleo with the food that's available today. True. Absolutely and, true. And so you feel that way as well, huh? Yes, that's absolutely true. I mean, the, it is very difficult to find pork and chicken that has not been fed grain. Even if you go to, you know, a farm that's on eatwild.org or something like that, it is very, very difficult. So I, I think that that is correct. I mean, you can do the best we can. Uh, but, and, you know, again, just because they were doing it that way doesn't mean that it's the right way. You know, the, you, you, what I like to do is look at what they were doing right, l- take all the good stuff, and leave out the bad stuff. You know, the Taramara Indians are huge lushes and they smoke. Am I going to do that if I want to run like them? <laughs> like, no. It's flawed logic, right? It's observational. I walk into the gym and I see a guy that's ripped and he's doing, you know, some stupid exercise. Am I going to start doing that exercise thinking it's going to make me look like that guy? No, there's a bunch of other variables that could explain that outcome. Right. Uh, but I would like to just, like, finish the conversation on, um, on fructose. So once that stuff gets transformed into palmitic acid, while fructose gets phosphorylated and excessively phosphorylated, there's some uric acid that gets created. And, you know, that excess uric acid or hyperuricemia is involved uh, in gout. And it right, actually, if you look right. at the work of Richard Johnson, some of its effects are, you know, very representative of the metabolic syndrome. I disagree with Richard Johnson if what he's indicating is that it's all due to uric acid. I don't think that's what's indicating, but I'm, I'm never of the type of it's all due to this. And if you hear right. someone say this problem is all due to this, human beings are multivariate complex organisms. That simply cannot be true. So you've got some uric acid that's produced, and you've got some palmitic acid that's produced. And the palmitic acid, um, the problem there is that your body is getting the signal that you're on a high-fat diet, but really you're on a high-carbohydrate diet because you ate sugar and there's still glucose in the bloodstream. So palmitic acid signals the turning on of insulin resistance in order to spare glucose for the brain. But in reality, it's not necessary because there's plenty of glucose around. It so there's fools a confusion. You. It fools you. Yeah, wow. exactly. So there's a confusion going on there. Uh, what's unfortunate is that a lot of researchers are not doing us a favor. And I, I like there's research by Axon and Axon and others. Uh, there's one that I was just reading recently about an inflammasome where they take mice and they put them on a high fat diet and they say, look, they got insulin resistance. And I'm like, well, yes, that's not surprising. For one, your diet was low in omega-3, and uh, it had plenty of trans fats in it, and et cetera, et cetera. But a high-fat diet should cause an individual to become insulin resistant in order to spare glucose for the brain. But the metabolic syndrome is not characterized by insulin resistance alone. It's insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, hyperglycemia, hyperuricemia, high blood pressure. All of these things come together, and a high-fat diet doesn't cause that. But I shouldn't say high-fat diet because, you know, this is a point I made to Gary Tobbs the other day. Like, you have to talk about food quality. I could be drinking corn oil and be on a high-fat diet. Would I be healthy? Like, no. (laughs) Right? Right. So there's there's confounding factors there in high-fat, and there's huge confounding factors in high-carbohydrate. Is it the starch in the grains that's the problem? No. It's the fact that the grains come with fructooligosaccharides, lectins, prolamine proteins, uh, and, and all of that stuff. Uh, and then the same thing, you look at fruit. Is it the, the glucose in the fruit that's a problem? No, it's the fructose. So there's a bunch of confounding factors there. So I don't like to use the term high-carbohydrate diet. I just say a high-starch or glucose diet, which I still think is fine. But now the interesting thing is that once you do have metabolic syndrome, which could be caused just by fructose overconsumption alone, if you right. were to artificially just give someone agave nectar 200 grams every day, you would do this within the, the span of two weeks, then their glucose tolerance goes down. So imagine that. They can no longer tolerate glucose because you gave them something else. Wow. And this is where the linear logic of a lot of nutritionists completely fails, like fat makes you fat, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It turns out that this something else caused the problem, and you have to be cognizant of that. Mm-hmm. 
It doesn't mean that this individual will never tolerate glucose again. Sometimes when the damage has been done for a long time, there's beta cell apoptosis in the pancreas, which limits. Right. Yeah, so in that case, you know, those people are going to have to go a little bit lower glucose or starch over the long term. Right. But there's some people I see just, you know, completely take out all of the crap, all the junk food, and by junk food, I mean grains and legumes. Um, they become, and, they become yeah, carbohydrate intolerant. Yeah, they, they can become carbohydrate intolerant, even though it was a specific carbohydrate, either fructose or some of the anti-nutrients in the, in the grains that did the trick and not necessarily the glucose itself. Uh, the same is true, I think, of protein. There's a lot of people that say, well, don't increase your protein intake. That's hard on the kidneys. No. In order for you to eat more protein, it is going to increase uric acid, but it's also going to increase uric acid excretion by the kidneys, unless your kidneys are damaged for some uh-huh. reason, right. at which point they can't adapt. And then it's a bad idea for you to eat more protein. But it's not the protein that caused the problem. Right. And actually, it's been shown by Richard Johnson and his coworkers that fructose can be a huge problem when it comes to the kidneys. Remember, I talked about the fact that the, about 30% of that fructose load goes to the kidneys. Right, right. So you have to be careful with that. All right, let's do this. Let's take our last commercial break. Mm-hmm. When we come back, I want you to weigh in on GMO. Since okay. you're a scientist, I'm sure you have an opinion. We're talking... <laughs> With Matt Lalonde, where we're talking about paleolithic styles of eating, especially for those of us who train hard. And uh, when we come back, I want to hear what Matt's opinion is of genetically modified organisms. We'll be right back. We're talking with Matt Lalonde. Interesting enough, somebody posted something on my wall. I have to find it. Somebody posted something on my wall, Matt. Um, Tom Furman's photo. It looks. It says Steve Bowser from CrossFit Affliction commented on Tom Furman's photo, and it's a photo of what looks like a Maasai um, native who is just. It looks like his skin is turned to leather. He's skinny, and it says, "Eat paleo food like a hunter gatherer and look like this guy." Brilliant logic. I'm having oatmeal for breakfast tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So again, completely flawed logic. Observational study. Uh, observation study of n equals one it's that's horrible yeah. it, that does not stand the rigors of science. you know you know there's a guy that posted something on youtube i don't want to get off the subject but there's a guy who posted something on youtube of a bunch of paleo individuals and i don't know maybe he poked but he poked he, he was showing this guy promotes paleo that guy promotes paleo look at the little bit of flab on his stomach this guy's got no muscle and it's like it's pathetic. They, they're, they're, so, they're so opposed to the paleo style of eating. And, and I find that it's vegetarians and vegans who are most opposed to it, which you were one at, at one time. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? I, whenever I give my seminar, I start out prefacing saying, this is not about high carb, low carb, omnivorism, vegetarianism, or carnivorism. That is your choice. I'm just going to discuss food quality, and then you decide what you want to do with that. And then I, I think that you can be a much healthier vegetarian by taking some aspects of paleo into your diet. Now, of course, that doesn't include meat, but let's say you can include a bit more fermented dairy, you can include more eggs, include fat for the love of God, please, so you can get some fat-soluble vitamins out of the food that you eat. So whenever you cook greens, you know, put some butter on there and stuff like that, you know, coconut oil and whatnot, I, I, I just, and then, you know, go ahead with the, the potatoes, just peel them because the Alpha chaconine and alpha solanine are actually in the peel, and those are I, I like. I like. I like the uh, the red potatoes better because they have slightly less sugar content to fiber content. Okay. Have you heard that? Yeah, but they. I mean, the potatoes do have a decent, not decent. They have some complete protein in them at least, so I do recommend them for vegetarians. And you okay, know, there's but, some but people peel, that are running experiments them. where they're running off of potatoes alone. So, but you say peel them. You should peel your. Potatoes. Yeah, you should probably peel them. If you know, that's almost always a good idea. There's some people that will argue that you know most of the there's a lot of nutrients in the peel that's too but that's where all the protective compounds that are synthesized by the plants will reside or most ah. of them so if you can if you can peel the peel it you should okay the world is getting more and more influenced by genetically modified foods uh, Monsanto announced yesterday that they were going to move forward on genetically modified wheat they say that it'll probably take them 10 years to reach their goal because wheat is so complex What's your opinion of all this GMO stuff? I mean, looking at what you know about... I take a very pragmatic view of that, very much like I I do of the the whole oil and sustainable energy. So there's some people that will get into the whole global warming argument and uh, is it really happening or not? And I kind of scratch my head and I look at it and say, okay, 
our coal reserves and oil reserves are limited, we should probably be studying renewable energy whether we like it or not because right. we're going to need it in the future. End of statement. That's it. Right. You know, that you can't argue with Why that. hang your, ha- your hat on something yeah. that is finite, that you know yeah. it's finite? Yeah. Why fight so, over it? I look at the genetically modified foods, and the greater majority of them are grains and legumes. So I don't care. Like, don't. I'm not going to eat those. I'm telling you that those should disappear. Legume agriculture might be sustainable. They do add nitrogen to the, so- to the soil. That's why soy is used uh, in, uh, in rotation with cornfields. But grain ag- agriculture is, you know, arguably not sustainable. So it now, has to go. So, I don't okay, care. so it doesn't matter. So, so your opinion is, look, they're not hurting me because I don't eat that stuff anyway. Yeah, and, and they have to, I think they have to go no matter what. What about, not, what about GMO sugar beets, which are very prominent now? Yeah, so then you get into like things like tomatoes and other uh, vegetables that will be genetically modified. And in that case, to me, it depends on how it occurred. There's a couple processes that you can use. One of them is that you're just going to take the seeds and submit them to radiation. It just like jumbles up the, the genes a little bit. That tends to be a little closer to what would actually happen in nature. Uh, same mm-hmm. is, is true when you cross breeds. Uh, so I'm not too worried about that. Like, listen, if you're, you're a guy, you're a woman, you guys have sex and you have a child, that's genetic engineering, okay? Right. Um, but when they start introducing genes from one species, like fish genes into tomatoes and what stuff they, like that. Which they're I, doing now, right? I, do- which what they are doing, that makes me a little bit nervous. Uh, you know, I always, I always think of the movie The Fly. Exactly. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, you know, push it that way. Um, but the problem, the reason why it makes me nervous is that we don't know with confidence what the outcome of that experiment will be. Yeah. We are running an experiment. I'm not saying it's going to be bad. I just don't know if it's going to be good. Do you? Do, I, I have to believe you are not a proponent of soy protein. No. Absolutely not. Uh, is it because the, of the legume, legume connection, or is there something else uh, that you don't like about it? It still has a you know a significant amount of problems associated with it. But you're encouraging an industry that I you know I simply cannot support. Once again. You know you know what was interesting? I was uh, did a show with Dr. Scott Connolly one day, and he said that he attended a lecture one time, and the gentleman that was talking about the, at the lecture was talking about soy, and he said mm-hmm. you know all these things that people embrace soy for the phytoestrogens, uh, and 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 uh, and so on. They're we're bad. actually, well, yeah, well, we're actually uh, a, a result of of evolutionary pressure to keep soy alive. So, so, so what soy does basically is it increases the, uh, the these uh, phytoestrogens, so that the animals that would eat it, their libido would drop, their litter rates would go down. What better way to put to, to end uh, an enemy by by killing it off? You know, it's off, no, no offspring, no more enemy. Sure. And, and, and we embrace that. It's like that's, the, that's, the, that's what soy did to protect itself, and we're going, oh, this is great stuff. It's got phytoestrogen in it. <laughs> I mean, it's insane. So, yeah, it's insane. when it comes to plants, uh, of the plant matter that I do recommend people eat, I always say, please cook it. It will deactivate some of the defense chemicals that are in the plants, and it will also increase the digestibility. Then when you get to things like grains and legumes, you can ferment them and increase the digestibility of the protein and maybe even destroy some of the other problematic compounds if you want, but the cost-to-benefit analysis just doesn't make sense to me anymore. Where do you stand on raw meats? Uh, there's a large, large movement growing now, uh, eating raw meats, raw chicken. As a matter of fact, there's a gentleman on Facebook who has his lunch posted. It's uh, one and a half pounds of raw chicken, 36 raw oysters, two pounds of tomatoes, and papaya. Yeah, so I get all of my meat from a uh, community support at agriculture, small farm uh, in Hardwick, Massachusetts called Chestnut Farms. And I visited the farm, and I know that all of the beef is, uh, all the cows are on pasture. They eat grass exclusively. So the the meat that I get that is beef from that CSA, I will eat raw. One of the arguments that you can make there is that the benefit of having this kind of meat is that it has a better fatty acid profile, but some of those fatty acids are polyunsaturated conjugated linoleic acid, for example, and then the omega-3s. Which means heat is so going to... It might affect them. Right. Yeah, it can, depending on how high the heat. Now, you can slow cook everything, too, and still get plenty of the benefits. But I just enjoy you know, raw beef in general. 
when it comes to the pork and the chicken, those were not, uh, those do get grain, like I said, nonetheless. And even like Joel Salatin feeds his chickens grain, okay? Right. Um, so there, for one, I try to minimize my consumption of that, and I find that the taste of that meat raw, I've tried it, is not all that great. Right. Um, right. So I, I would never eat raw meat from a supermarket as well. It, it, I just The source has to be trusted, and I know that this is butchered in a small shop, um, a small facility uh, in the area and whatnot. So I do it. I not going to recommend it uh, if the source is clean I think that it can be okay and you know the the fat is uh, definitely not going to get oxidized under those circumstances what about but, the, the, the individuals that promote and, and I eat raw meat periodically mm-hmm. I don't eat it around people that I love because it grosses them out yes but yeah. I I mean and interestingly enough I can eat a, a pound of of grass-fed uh, beef mm-hmm. uh, ground beef 15 oh, percent fat I know I, I love it actually and and my stomach doesn't even feel full. If I ate that same amount of cooked beef, I would be bloated for hours. So something tells me that it, my body likes it better. But with that being said, what about the argument that cooking denatures the protein and therefore we're not getting everything we can? Is that true? Doesn't, no, doesn't I mean, the digestive so system denature the protein? Cooking does denature the, the protein. That doesn't mean that it's worse. And you might make some arguments that it's, easier to digest in certain instances and such is truly the case for plants. Plant components are always going to be harder to digest and that's because plants can't run away from predators. So they have to make so everything about them has to be more difficult mm. to digest. The predators can't get at them such so easily. Uh that's not the case for animals of course because they've got teeth claws and and they can run so that you tend to have a you know more easily to digest and fewer defense chemicals. Okay. Um, with the exception of like you know things like puffer fish, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here you go. Um, but um, what was the question again? I think I lost about denaturing about. protein from cooking. Oh, that's it. right. You know, people you can keep... make an argument that that's actually a good thing when it comes to eggs, for example, because you're going to denature the avidin that could uh, bind the biotin. So, you know, sometimes it's a plus, sometimes it's a minus. You have to look at each case individually. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think like you know denaturing sounds bad because you're ruining nature, but really you're just creating some sulfide bonds. Well, also I've there. had guests on the show that said, look, your digestive acids denature the protein. Yes, they unfold. They do. <laughs> they, they, uh, denaturing <laughs> is, is unfolding. Yeah. You might as well start unfolding it, you know, yeah. ahead of time. Yep, so they, they denature it and they decompose it. They take the protein and they decompose it to amino acids. What do so, you think the benefits of eating raw, other than the, the, the not changing the fat structure, what, what do you think the benefits of eating raw meat are? are they, what about the enzymes that stay intact? Do you think there's a benefit from those? Possibly. I would have to do some more research on that and to give you like a, an educated answer. Okay, okay. Listen, Matt, we've come to the end of the interview and I have more questions for you. We have to have you back on sometime, okay? Sure. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. I'm glad that you made time to come on Supremo Radio. Thank, thanks so much. No problem. And I, usually this is where I plug your book, your website, uh, your blog, but I don't have any of that stuff. So those of you who know Matt, give him a hug. There you go. <laughs> Next time you see him at a CrossFit event, get up and give him a hug. Say, I, I heard you on Supremo Radio. I know you got nothing to sell. Let me give you a hug. That's all. All right, listen, Matt, thanks so much for being on the show. All right, no problem. All right.